Well, hello there, everybody, and thank you for being here. And a big um, uh, thank you to Chris and DC Environmental Network, not only for hosting us on this panel, but also for having just a, a great week of events and panels and organizing this important conference to circulate big ideas on addressing the climate crisis, because uh, as we all know, that's what it is. It, it's a crisis and we need to treat it as such. So I am going to kick things off with um, a little bit about our panel on floods, fires, and fauna. You know, today's topic, as you all know, is regarding climate change and wildlife. And what I want to share first off is, you know, the recognition that although we're the only species driving climate change, us as homo sapiens, we're not the only species affected by it. And you know, in the in the picture of disproportionate impacts, uh, other species are ones who will oftentimes bear the brunt of those impacts. So um, we'll be talking about that today. Just a quick introduction. My name is Max Broad. I'm the president of DC Voters for Animal Ed Education Fund. We do uh, education and research around policy issues for animals in Washington DC on the local level, and. Um, you know, looking to COP26 in Glasgow that just wrapped up, Chris, Chris just referenced, uh, there was this great article from the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark that brings up uh, not only how humans are using animals to cause climate change, I, I have to bring that up because I, I come from a climate advocacy background, um, you know, raising animals for food as a driver for climate change but also how um, the animals are seeing the impacts of climate change uh, at the front lines of it. And uh, so, you know, we're starting to see this on a, on a global scale. And sure enough, last week, an article came out about how birds in the Amazon are adapting to climate change by getting smaller. So, you know, we're, we're even seeing some um, evolutionary responses. And, and so, you know, some of the ways that different species are responding to climate change is through migration patterns, uh, having to adapt to extreme climate events, and you know, droughts affect, have specific effects on invertebrates, reptiles and amphibians, unseasonable weather, weather anomalies are very challenging for different species. And you know, of course the change in habitat range for species that are used to warmer or cooler weather. But you know, in this panel, we're going to be really diving into some of the local uh, perspectives on habitat and climate change. And there's two great reports that cover this topic, one from the EPA and the other from our very own Department of Energy and Environment in DC. And you know, a big, uh, some of the key takeaways, rising seas, of course, impact uh, habitat. Uh, so, you know, we have vulnerable areas in the Anacostia River, Roosevelt Island, and Potomac River marshes. Um, rising temperatures affect the timing of plant development. So, you know, our spring and fall seasons especially, uh, and that influences migration patterns. Major storms in breeding season can impact reproduction. Um, extreme heat leads to heat stress and decreases in food availability and water quality. And you know, several vulnerable species were identified from different, different components of the animal kingdom. You know, spotted, spotted turtle is highly vulnerable because of increased flooding, which displaces large uh, parts of populations and elevates its mortality races, rates and breeding success. The queen snake depends on clean running streams and watersheds with cool water. Amphibians are particularly susceptible because they have low movement availability. They, they can't be easily displaced. Uh, the wood thrush is a bird that 82% um, has experienced 82% loss of its current summer range or is expected to by 2080. So you can see how these different animals on a local scale are, are already seen as susceptible and vulnerable to climate change. So we'll be going into what we can be doing and, and what the outlook is for improving upon wildlife under the context of climate change. And we have two wonderful speakers to do that from City Wildlife. 
Um, the, the, our first speaker um, is going to be Jim Monsma, and we, um, he'll be talking from the, the perspective of City Wildlife. Just a quick note about City Wildlife. They opened their first ever and only wildlife rehabilitation center in D.C. in 2013. And they're treating about 2,000 injured, sick, and orphan wild animals each year. They also run two citizen science programs. One is Lights Out DC, um, where volunteers monitor downtown Washington during bird migration seasons, rescuing birds who have hit windows and collecting the ones who are killed. The data they amass is used to convince building owners to take steps to reduce future collisions. And City Wildlife's other program, Duck Watch, volunteers help mother ducks cross streets, overcome barriers, and find a way out of courtyards and off roofs to get to the newly hatched broods to water. So, you know, you can see City Wildlife has a direct impact on the well-being of our wildlife in within the district. And um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jim, the executive director of City Wildlife. Thanks, Max. Appreciate that. We, um, there we go. Oops. There we are. Hope that's working. Anyway, I'd like to, um, thanks, Max, for those kind words. Uh, I'd like to start my talk by pointing out that um, something may not be obvious is that DC does, in fact, have an awful lot of wildlife. Um, we at City Wildlife know that probably a little better than most people, simply because we're running a rehabilitation clinic and we're frankly quite surprised at the number of animals that come in, the kinds and the numbers every day. Um, and it begs the question, where have these animals been? How, where are they living? Um, and the short answer is, of course, that they're living wherever they can. And that essentially is the definition of habitat. If an area of whatever size can support the life of an animal, it is habitat. On the other side of the coin, is that animals need habitat to survive. But therein, as Max has pointed out, lies the problem because with climate change, um, things are changing in that habitat. And sometimes um, the areas end up not supporting the same life or as many lives as they once did. Now there's a group called, this is a mouthful, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. But what it is, is essentially it's a think tank made up of conservation biologists from all around the world, and they consult with governments on preserving biodiversity and ecosystems. And they estimate that climate change will be the fastest ca growing cause of species loss in the Americas by mid-century. And that's because those habitats that once supported life are changing so that they no longer do so, um, or at least not at the same level. So the bottom line is we have to take care of our habitats. Here in DC, most of our best habitat is in parks and publicly owned lands, and that's vital. Ann Lewis will talk about that in a minute. I am going to focus my talk on another um, place where you find habitat. We don't always think of it, but that's our yards. Much of my talk is based on the work of two people, um, people that I admire greatly. One, Nancy Lawson, the humane gardener. That's the book she wrote and the other, Doug Ptolemy, a professor at the University of Delaware, has written two books, one called um, Bringing Nature Home, the other called Nature's Best Home, Hope, I'm sorry. And Doug points out that 83% of the continental United States is privately owned. So our national parks and our other parks and all of our wildlife preserves are vital to preserving biodiversity, but they're not nearly large enough and they're too isolated and animals don't like to stay in parks. They don't know a park is a park. They like to move around and they'll leave a park if they feel like it. So he points out that what we really need is a nationwide effort to create and sustain habitat where we can in our yards and in other privately owned spaces like businesses or schools or religious institutions. And there's been a lot of talk lately uh, in the conservation biology community about climate change refugia, which are essentially small areas or some not so small that for one reason or another, largely physical barriers are somewhat protected from the worst effects of climate change. So what Doug and what Nancy are suggesting is that we make our yards 
sort of refugia on a small scale that um, that we uh, engineer them, not just to be nice places for us, but to support life. Imagine, for instance, that there is a drought in your area. Well, if enough people put water out for animals, more animals would survive and less animals will suffer. It's a concept that one of my favorite poets, Gary Snyder, captures in his famous quote, nature is not a place you visit, it's home. We have to recognize that our yards are nature too. And we have to start working such that the nature that's in our yard becomes habitat that is as abundant and as life-sustaining as it can be. So how do we do that? How do we create habitat in our yard? Let me take you back for one second to Overlook Elementary School in LaGrange, New York, where Mrs. Carnes presided over the third grade. She had a lesson for us little third graders on what was needed for life, and I'll never forget it. There were four things on her list. You can probably guess what they are. One was food, one was water, one was shelter. And then because Mrs. Carnes was kind of a church lady and because once Sean Leahy took his clothes off in the art class, she added clothing to the list. But since we're talking about wildlife, we can probably take clothing off. And my friend Dan and I thought that by all rights, dogs should be on a list of what's essential for life. But that's another thing. So anyway, for now, we're talking about food, water, and shelter. If you can provide those three things for animals, you're providing habitat. Or even if you can provide just one or two of those things and the other ones are accessible nearby, you're helping to provide habitat. And it needn't be done on a big scale. You can do a little, little things on balconies, on patios. I was reading recently that there's a little park in Brooklyn, New York, and the horticultural director found a very rare bee there. It's called the Bum Blueberry Digger Bee, quite the name. And she immediately called all of her neighbors around this little park in Brooklyn and told them to start planting native blueberries on their porches and their little yards, on their roofs, wherever they could. The idea being that they could bring back a habitat um, that's centered around this blueberry digger bee. And we hope that works. So anyway, let's take a closer look, starting with the um, first thing on Mrs. Karn's list, food. Now, if you're thinking about feeding wildlife, you probably think about hanging a bird feeder, and that could be helpful. But a better thing to do is to build a food chain. Take this chickadee, for example. If you live in the suburbs or even in some of the areas of the city, you have a decent chance of hosting a family of chickadees. But you're going to need caterpillars. You're going to need lots of caterpillars. As Doug Ptolemy did a study, he found out that chickadee parents bring a caterpillar to the nest once every three minutes. And they do this from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. for each of the 16 to 18 days it takes the chicks to fledge. So an incredible 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars are required to make one clutch of chickadees. Well, where are we gonna get this kind of these kind of caterpillars? The nice thing is that actually it's pretty easy. If you plant the right plants, you get the caterpillars. They take care of it themselves. The problem is we don't have the right plants. Most of our houses have lawns. Here's a graphic from the Lawn Reform Coalition that shows the number of birds in the corner supported by a typical lawn on the top of the diagram, or the number of birds supported by native plants as in the bottom of this diagram. There's quite a difference. And the concept is that birds eat insects and most insects eat plants. But plants, but insects don't typically just eat any plant, they're a little bit picky. We all know about the monarch, for instance, everybody knows that the monarch, their babies, their caterpillars need milkweed, but they're not unusually picky for the insect world. Most insects have a host plant that they rely on and they'll eat that and they won't eat anything else. But if you go to the local nursery, you'll find that on sale there are a whole lot of plants from Asia and all over the world. You put those in your yard and you don't have anything for the local insects, the insects that live in North America to eat because they don't recognize Asian plants. So if you want to build a food chain, you've got to have the native plants because that's what the native insects will eat. And doing a little research helps. This is Doug Ptolemy's list of the local trees, some of them native trees, and how many um, butterfly and moth Everything caterpillars. Okay? Um, the species will host. 
Uh, as you can see, you can't do much better than oak trees. Oak trees are about the best. So you could do a little research and the idea being to put those plants in your yard that host the most number of insects, which will produce the most amount of food for birds. Of course, birds don't eat only insects. They do eat plants, especially berries. This is a good one. This is service berry. And it's pretty easy to get around here. I have one in my yard. And the list of animals or birds, particularly that service berries um, provide food for is pretty incredible. American robin, Baltimore oriole, brown thrasher, cedar waxwing, eastern bluebird, eastern towhee, gray catbird, hairy woodpecker, hermit thrush, northern cardinal, northern mockingbird, wood thrush, the list goes on. And I know that I have one in my yard and it's a pretty busy place, especially when the berries are turning ripe. Um, so anyway, the idea is build a food chain in your yard and you will be providing food much beyond what you can do with a bird feeder. Next thing on Mrs. Carnes' list is water. Water's pretty easy. Um, and we all know that you can go without food uh, for a little while, but you can't go without water for very long at all. So you can put out just a saucer, the kind that you put under a big flower pot, and you'll find that it's much appreciated, especially in dry in winter when everything's frozen. Uh, you just have to remember to keep that dish clean and disinfected. So that's water, that's food. What about shelter? Well, of course you can put out artificial nest boxes and they're helpful. Um, most of the purple martins such as these that we see are living in artificial boxes these days. And Eastern bluebirds only saw their number rebound when people started putting out Eastern bluebird houses. And you don't need as much space as you might think. If for instance, you were to go to the nature center in Rock Creek Park and walk around the back, you'll see in the corner there a little piece of land and they've put a bluebird box there and it's occupied. They've been raising bluebirds right in that little piece of land. Um, so you can get nest boxes, not just for birds. They sell them for bats. They sell them for squirrels. They sell them for raccoons. Go online and you'll find a lot of these things. Um, just have to pay attention to the instructions of how to put them up and where to hang them. Um, an easier thing, which is especially good news for those of you who don't like to do yard work, is to leave the leaves in the fall. Um, you'll find that uh, butterflies such as and moths, such as this luna moth, have their pupa in the leaves over the winter. So if you're raking those leaves up and disposing of them, you're disposing of the insects. They're not gonna be there next spring. And other animals like to hide in the leaves, such as this little decays brown snake, which is um, the little guy in the lower right. The first winter I tried this, leaving my leaves all winter. The next spring, I found these decays brown snakes. I don't know where they came from. They weren't there before, but I left the leaves and they showed up. Of course, my neighbor was convinced they were copperheads, but I, um, I had a little talk and he knows better than that now. So keep your list of yard work getting smaller and smaller. Another thing you can neglect to do helpfully is to trim the dead heads off of um, the perennials and the flowers in your yard when the blooming season is over. Lots of insects will, will spend the winter burrowed into the stalks. In fact, if you look carefully, you'll probably see that a downy woodpecker is creeping up and down the stalks that you've left in your yard, pulling the insect pupae out. That's the kind of food, um, that's the kind of food chain that we're talking about building here. And as long as you're leaving the smaller plants, you might as well leave the big trees if you can afford to. Big trees are essentially condos for wildlife. All kinds of animals from raccoons and squirrels on down to insects will leave a dead tree. Um, so don't take those down unless you absolutely have to. They're really good real estate. Brush piles make good real estate. All you have to do is leave a pile of sticks and leaves in the corner of your yard and you will find, especially in harsh weather, that the animals appreciate that. You would think that that would attract rats. I thought it would, but keep your piles small and you won't have any problem. I've done this uh, for years in Hyattsville and I've never had a rat problem, but I've had a lot of animals use those brush piles. Finally, in terms of shelter, you might think about roosting spots. Roosting is what birds do um, all year long, not just nesting, but they sleep in trees and they like to sleep in trees with dense foliage. Cedar trees like these ones are really good for morning doves. 
people in town that I know have ivy that grows on walls and that's a good place for birds to roost in. And in fact, if you can get native ivy to grow on your wall, then you'll be supplying berries and insects as well. Um, they also sell roosting boxes online. Not all birds will use them, but some will. So those are a few things you can consider to provide the food and the shelter and the water for animals to make your yard a kind of a refugia in tough times for animals. One thing to consider, the old adage, first, do no harm. You don't wanna attract wildlife to your yard if in fact it's going to be a dangerous place. And there's lots of dangers you might not consider. For instance, this looks like a pretty normal view, doesn't it? Um, we're all used to seeing this thing, but the mulch under those trees can be a problem. Here's what happens. The insects come along and they lay their eggs on the leaves of the trees. The larva grows up eating the leaves of the tree. And when it's time to pupate, to turn into adults, the, the larva just falls to the ground. But if they fall onto mulch, it's kind of a dead end. They need to fall into leaf litter and soft soil. But if they fall into mulch, as I say, they don't go anywhere and they won't be there the next year to produce another generation of these, um, of these insects. So best not to mulch around your trees. An ornithologist named Daniel Clem, who studies the problem of window bird collisions, has determined that in his estimation, every building in the United States kills a bird a year. And if you think about it, that's an awful lot of dead birds. And you want to make sure that your house is not one of those that is killing birds. And if you have a window that is a problem for birds, you probably know about it. The good news is that there are things you can do uh, to treat the window and keep birds from hitting it and, um, and killing themselves, essentially, is what happens, or wounding themselves and save you a trip to city wildlife if you um, treat your window. I had to do this to a couple of my windows and there are ways that are 100% effective at saving birds. So just give us a call if you have a window that's causing problems and we'll walk you through the steps. Another thing you remember, 1962, Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring warning about the dangers of pesticides. That has not gone away. In fact, some of the pesticides that are in use today are truly scary. You may have heard of a class of pesticides called neonicotinoids or neonix, because that's kind of hard to pronounce. They're pretty common and they're, and they're widespread and they're legal. And in fact, neonix are the most common pesticide in use today on planet Earth. But they are so deadly to birds that even one seed coated with neonic can kill a bird, particularly hard on the grassland species whose numbers are already plummeting. This is like the last thing they need. But the danger is that you may be using neonics in your yard and not even realizing it. There was a study by the American Bird Conservancy and Friends of the Earth that determined that 50% of the seedlings being sold at a Lowe's contained neonics. And people were bringing them home, not knowing that, putting it in the yard and killing birds. So there is a movement to label plants with neonix, but at any rate, if you're buying plants at a nursery, you should ask about neonix, which ones have been treated, which one haven't, do they have their signs up? A couple of other quick points. Um, pets, uh, both dogs and cats do not mix well with wildlife. If you're inviting animals, wild animals to your yard, you wanna make sure that you have your dog or your cat confined. Um, this is in my estimation, and anyone that works in a wildlife rehab clinic's estimation, one of the biggest problem that animals face. We get more, you would think it would be cars, and cars are bad. We get a lot of victims of cars, but not nearly as many victims of cars as we get victims of cat and dog attacks. That may be because people bring us animals if their animal hurt, if their pet hurts it, but they don't necessarily bring us an animal if they hit it with their car. But whatever, you do want to confine your dog or your cat before, um, before you're attracting all these uh, birds and other small animals to your house. Same thing goes with um, basic lawn care. Uh, before you start cutting limbs off of trees or mowing the lawn or trimming bushes, you want to take a quick look and see who's living there, who's at home right now and do what you can to mow around them or come back at a later date. If you have to cut trees down, November is probably the best month 
But of course, those trees are used all year long, but at least this time of year, you won't um, most likely be displacing a litter of squirrels or woodpeckers. So those are just a couple of things that you can think about in terms of um, what we can do to make our yards safe for animals. And it, it's, it's something that our grandparents didn't really have to think about. Uh, how can we help birds survive? The birds used to take care of themselves and they're still capable of doing it, but they do need habitat. And so our yards, it's no longer good enough for them to look pretty. Um, they're gonna have to function as, as real habitats for animals. If you're interested in this, there's lots of good material and you're gonna wanna look into this a bit more. A couple of things to Google. Doug Ptolemy, who I mentioned, his website, Homegrown National Park, Nancy Lawson, has a website and a very good Facebook page, the Humane Gardener. National Audubon Society has um, a whole database on native plants that's worth looking at, it's very detailed. And the American Bird Conservancy um, on their website has both the list of threats and a list of solutions that you can use to take care of it. So I urge you to, um, to learn more about this and do what you can to turn your yard into wildlife habitat. So I'll turn this over to Anne now. Thank you, Jim. That was fantastic. And uh, you gave a lot of information about what we as individuals can do. And now I'm gonna look a, a little bit more about uh, what we as a community can do. So um, first of all, let's look at what the effects of ch climate change are on wildlife. This is globally. Um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN it's called, maintains the important red list that you may have heard of that identifies species around the world that are threatened with extinction. The organization whose logos are on the right, they're all parts, part of IUCN. Um, the IUCN has identified 38,500 species that are in imminent danger of extinction. And of those 10,967 are threatened specifically by climate change. The long-term effects of climate change of all these species would be profound. As species are lost, biodiversity decreases and the ecosystem services they provide are no longer available. You can think of um, the importance of bats and bees to our agriculture and, and uh, comfort. With fewer species, resiliency often decreases and the negative effects on humans increase because everything is interconnected. The effects of climate change on wildlife can take several forms. They're ecological effects. Uh, one example, salmon, for example, are very rich in nutrients, which they gain from their lifetimes in the nutrient-rich oceans. Salmon need cool streams to spawn and their streams are warming. When they abandon these streams, the main source of food for the grizzly bear diminishes, forcing the bear to eat foods that are less rich in nutrients like berries and bulbs. This in turn means that the bear poop is less rich and in many Northwest forests, bear poop is critical for the health of the trees since salmon can account for 20% of the metabolism of the tree. So the entire ecosystem can be altered just because of the loss of salmon. Their behavioral effects too. It's now well documented that bird migration and breeding times are being altered by warming temperatures. One study in California um, found that house, uh, house finches, uh, for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature, the finches nested four and a half days earlier. This could be a problem, not only because an extreme cold front could kill these nestlings, but also because the food sources needed for breeding may no longer be in sync with the birds nesting. Heat can also have physiological effects. For example, the sex of sea turtle eggs is determined by the temperature and the amount of rainfall that surrounds them during their incubation period. Higher temperatures result in more females and cooler temperatures result in more males. In Australia, for example, climate change is now producing green sea turtle eggs that are 99% female. 
And you can see what that does to reproduction rates. Other studies have found that migrating birds' bodies are getting smaller and their wings longer. Uh, this is also attributed to climate change. There's a, an ecological rule called Bergman's rule that suggests that animals will get smaller as heat increases because they don't need as much body fat for insulation in warm weather. Um, but oddly, some species are actually getting larger. This imbalance worries scientists because it could ultimately affect the survival of some species and the loss of biodiversity overall. Whoops. And the last one is genetic effects. Um, warming temperatures have also contributed to geneti genetic changes. Two spadefoot toad species native to the Southwest have started to interbreed because one of the species seems to be more tolerant of the ever warming puddles, which is their habitat. Um, this creates a genetic mix. But since crossbred offspring are often infertile, it's unclear whether these hybrids will thrive because they're more robust or cause both species to peter out because they're infertile. So let's look at some of these discernible effects here in DC. These are things we ourselves have witnessed. Um, migration times, our Lights Out DC program volunteers have been extending their fall migration monitoring by a few days every year since our program began in 2010. Uh, this year, we're still finding woodcocks in the middle of November, but we used to end monitoring at the end of October. In breeding terms of breeding times, for two years in a row, Duck Watch, our program, has monitored a mallard nest, a mallard hen, nesting in the bushes at the National Geographic building in the middle of January, fully six weeks earlier than usual. The ducklings of these broods did hatch, but were killed by a cold snap shortly afterward. Previous warm weather in those years may have confused this duck into thinking it was an early spring, but now we're no longer surprised by these anomalies. And then check out the roseate spoon spoonbill. On, Jan on July 31st of this year, this roseate spoonbill, which is native to the Southeastern United States, was spotted, spotted in Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. Dan Rausch, who's Department of Energy and Environment's ornithologist speculates that their permanent habitat may move northward over time as temperatures increase, because this species seems particularly adaptable. Extreme weather. Need I remind you how hot this past summer was? And also, the area experienced two rare, rare tornadoes on July 1st, and one was in DC itself. We can expect to see more of these extreme climate events. Regional measurements, and I'm stressing local, show that snow is shifting to rain, precipitation amounts are increasing, streams are getting warmer, sea levels are rising, and growing scenes are, seasons are getting longer all here at home. All these changes will affect our local wildlife. And lastly, species mortality. One good gauge of which species are declining in DC is the district's official wildlife action plan. This plan identifies the district's species of greatest conservation need, or as we nickname them, SGCN. The first report was issued in 2005, and it was revised in 2015. In the interim, 90 species of animals were added to this list. So there are now 205 species listed as SGCN, including some of our beloved species, the box turtle, the Virginia opossum, and even DC's official bird, the wood thrush. So what can we do? Um, obviously, globally, we need to support efforts to reduce climate change and in general, raise awareness of wildlife's val value, not only intrinsically, but also to our human populations. But locally, there's a lot we can do. Um, we can eliminate threats to wildlife in our city. We can protect and increase our urban habitat and we can provide wildlife corridors. So some of the threats to DC's wildlife, and I stress that we could do a talk on every single one of these species for an hour, but briefly, their habitat fragmentation, invasive species, water quality issues, stream channelization, light and sound pollution, glass collisions, rodenticides, that's secondary rod uh, rodenticide poisoning in wildlife, traffic, and Jim mentioned cats. 
Um, Jim, and, uh, Jim has already stressed the importance of keeping cats indoors. Um, but this shot slide shows the man-made causes of mortality for birds. By far the largest factor is habitat loss, which includes habitat fragmentation and degradation. And since we don't have much of a power line problem in DC, the main threats here to birds other than habitat loss are cats and window collisions. Um, our bird collision monitoring program, Lights Out DC, has been collecting data on window collisions for 10, 11 years now. Since 2010, when we started the program, we found over 4,000 birds in just the small area we monitor between Union Station and the Convention Center. We've had some success working with the owners of the most problematic buildings to reduce these collisions, and we commend especially the Convention Center for installing film on its overpass that's reduced collisions there by 87%. But we still have a long way to go before all buildings in DC are bird safe. And I parenthetically state that it could, this could be a good opportunity for some bird safe legislation in the city. We can also prevent fragmentation and overuse of parks. Fragmentation of habitat reduces its value for many forest interior dwelling species, like the wood thrush and veery, who need large uninterrupted forest areas to breed. Fragmentation can occur in when, many ways, but in DC, one of the most significant causes is the so, so-called social trail that's created when off-leash dogs run through the woods or even when people create shortcuts through the parks. This is occurring in most of our urban parks. Glover Archbold Park, for example, is now riddled with social trails at, that fragment habitat and birders there are finding fewer forest interior dwelling species in the park. Controlling off-leash dogs has been a long-standing problem throughout DC and hostilities against park personnel trying to enforce the dog leash laws are not uncommon. So we would like to see people obey these laws. And then there's channelization. Channelization occurs when man-made seawalls are built to replace the natural edge of a water body. Channelization not only reduces habitat, but also eliminates the natural flood control provided by a living shoreline. Living shorelines offer a variety of breeding grounds for wildlife, and they're also a foundation of the food chain because they support vast numbers of reptiles, amphibians, fish, and invertebrates that the higher orders eat. Unfortunately, most of DC's river edges are channelized. The Anacostia River along here um, was channelized between 1902 and 1960 when the Corps of Engineers dredged the river and filled in the marshes in order to create a navigable waterway um, from the DC line to the, um, to the beginning of the Anacostia River. Almost all of DC's portion of the Anacostia has remained channelized, including Haynes Point and the Washington Channel up in, in here. Um, but the Corps of Engineers and DOEE are now focused on ecosystem restoration along the Anacostia. The problem is complex though. It's that re restoration is now difficult because the areas adjacent to the river are all built up and most of them would require substantial alterations to accommodate a natural shoreline. But anything new should not involve a channelized shoreline. Similarly, the DC side of the Potomac River all along here um, is effectively channelized all the way to its confluence with Rock Creek, and then again in Georgetown until just past Key Bridge. Theodore Roosevelt Island is the only shoreline in the river that's remained totally unchannelized, and consequently, it remains a, a rich habitat for wildlife. So let's look at history. Um, habitat doesn't just happen. DC is fortunate to have more park space and natural habitat than most urban areas. We have 7,000 acres of parkland, including Rock Creek Park. That's one of the largest urban parks in the country at 17,000 plus acres. But our parkland didn't just happen. You can see from the original L'Enfant plan at the left, 1791, that there's no indication of any parks other than a few traffic circles intended for sculpture. But by the late 1800s, the oppressive heat in Washington spurred the federal government to acquire land for a park so the president could have a cooler summer retreat. And I do mean acquire. The land that's now 
Rock Creek Park was all privately owned and had to be acquired from its not always co cooperative private owners. But by 1890, most of the land had been acquired and Rock Creek Park was officially de designated one of the country's first national parks. Legislation specified that the park would, and I quote, provide for the preservation from injury of all timber, animals, or curiosities within said park and their retention in their natural condition as nearly as possible, end quote. There have been constant threats to the park though. The Macmillan Commission of 1902 prevented a major highway through the park. And later there've been other proposals for an auto campground for tourists and for each state to have its own exhibition site of up to six acres. Mercifully, these things didn't happen, but threats to the park will reoccur and require deliberate work and commitment by the public to restrain the urge to overdevelop the park. There aren't many large areas left to develop in DC, but there are a few. The largest is the old soldier's home property just north of the complex of hospitals uh, that contains 272 acres and substantial oak and spruce habitat for birds and small mammals. Plans are underway for part of this site that would include more than 4 million square feet of development. The developers say they hope to include up to 20 acres of open space in the plan, but the drawings suggest that this will be mostly for human use. We would encourage preservation of the habitat areas as plans develop. Um, the nearby Macmillan Reservoir site on the left in the slide contains 25 acres, but plans there too have just recently moved forward for high density mixed use development that'll leave six acres of open space for an urban park Again, that park is going to be mostly a, an urban human based park. Plans for the RFK site in the bottom slide offer many more opportunities for habitat without diminishing its value for human uses. The site is along the Anacostia River and the National Park Service controls the strip of riparian land that separates the RFK site from the river. The opportunities to enhance habitat here are great since the site is directly across from Kingman and Heritage Islands. <coughs> Kingman and Heritage Islands are the bright spot for wildlife in DC. Marsh restoration at Kingman Lake is well underway. And in 2005, Mayor Williams declared the island as, islands a conservation area with a special focus on preserving the Southern part of Kingman as habitat. That's this area in here uh, to the right in the slide. Plans for educational facilities on these islands are ongoing and are, and are under the direction of DOEE. And DOEE commissioned a thorough environmental report that serves as the basis for all decisions. This project is a huge win for DC's wildlife and the, for the people who enjoy it. And there remains one other opportunity for substantial habitat in DC, it's Poplar Point. At present, Poplar Point is slated for transfer from the federal to the district government as soon as a master plan is approved. Under the agreement, DC is required to keep 70 acres of the property, which is 110 acres total uh, in open space. A large area of the property, the green area in this slide, is currently wooded with kind of low scrub woodland. And it's used for low impact uses like a tree nursery and greenhouses and its habitat for numerous species of wildlife, including some species of greatest conservation need. So we encourage everyone to participate in the planning process for Poplar Point and to advocate for the preservation of its open space as habitat. There are also a lot of things we can do to improve existing habitat by creating wildlife corridors that link existing wildlife areas or remove barriers between them. These opportunities are unlimited, ranging from green trails and daylighted streams to rooftop gardens. The Wildlife Action Plan includes wildlife corridors as one of its recommendations for habitat improvement. Many cities have included effective projects for wildlife crossings over barriers like the one below. These may be too ambitious for DC, but we have many smaller barriers that should be altered to allow animals to pass over or under. Two of these that come to my mind are the military road median barrier that prevents ground moving animals from going from Rock Creek to the island. 
it's a stone wall that prevents turtles and ducklings from um, nesting uphill from getting safely across the road to, con to the canal and the river. And there are certainly many others. These, these two maps suggest some possibilities for corridors. The Anacostia waterfront front framework plan recommends improving the river corridor, daylighting many of its tributary streams and completing the ring of trails that connects the Fort Circle parks of Fort Mahan, Stanton and DuPont. Uh, and we wanna commend Ward 8 Woods for because they're currently working hard to restore these parks to help. Um, and I stress this corridor trail, uh, it's part of a corridor that would link all the Fort Circle parks and the trail could go entirely around DC linking these many uh, residual parks. The other map is a DOEE map that shows all the green roofs that exist in DC. The potential for green roofs as habitat is great as has been proven by prototypes in England and Switzerland. It doesn't take much imagination to see how a series of green roofs could create a continuous habitat corridor from the Anacostia to Rock Creek Park, at least for birds, bats, and flying in invertebrates. As an example, the rooftop of the Chicago City Hall was remodeled some years ago to include a green roof. It was intended as a showcase for Illinois' native plants, and 150 different plant species were installed, including trees, shrubs, and vines. What was unexpected was that it became a stopover for many species of migrating birds, including some rare ones like the olive-sided flycatcher. It also is home for 3,000 bees and some nesting wrens. The roof is now monitored by Chicago birders during migratory seasons, and it's considered a successful urban habitat. Habitats can also go vertical. This amazing building in Japan can serve both animals on the ground and birds in the air. And there's something similar happening here locally. It's Amazon's proposed new HQ2 headquarters in Arlington. Amazon's goal is to create a green environment within this large project. The Helix building on the right there offers ample opportunity for habitat, but as designed, it could also be hazardous to birds with unprotected glass immediately adjacent to the plantings. Amazon is aware of the problem and has told the American Bird Conservancy that it plans to use bird safe glass, but they haven't said this publicly yet. So this means we need to keep their feet to the fire. So this leaves us where we began with the responsibility for habitat creation falling to the humans who care. This is the plan for DC's parks and greenways that was created by the Macmillan Commission in 1902, the same guys who protected Rock Creek Park from the highway. But like them, it takes the commitment of all of us to see the, that these things come to fruition. There are huge opportunities here to protect our local, local wildlife and these animals benefit people as well as the animals. So I hope you will join City Wildlife's Voice for Wildlife as the district moves forward with all its commendable green initiatives and with development plans for areas like RFK and Poplar Point, because the future of DC's wildlife is really in our hands. So thank you. And I think we can take questions now. Yes. Thanks so much, Anne. Thank you, Jim. We'll, we'll, we'll turn it over to questions and I just kind of want to recap things here. So, you know, in terms of the, the big thing on wildlife, I should join the, the spotlight. In terms of the big things on wildlife, um, you know, the, let's just point out that these used to be self-sustaining systems, but now they need interventions uh, in many regards for humans to be able to um, uh, contribute and preserve wildlife and habitat. And you all, you all may have noticed that there was a conscious effort in this presentation to share about how, what we can actually do. And th th that's a beautiful thing because, you know, solving climate change single-handedly just can't be done. It feels so intractable and, and impossible. And so, you know, Jim and Ann did a great job of the, the ways that individuals can make a difference, um, you know, conserving habitat right in our yards and being conscious about the ecosystems that we're creating with, with our 
landscapes on our property, as well as um, you know the ways that we can advocate for preservation and the the importance of civic engagement, whether that's on the policy level or um, in the local government level, to preserve habitat and maintain corridors. So. With that being said, let's turn it over to questions. I see uh, Stella, you you have your hand up, and then we'll go to Phelan Von Kuhl. Hey, everyone. Anne and Jim, thank you for your great presentations. And Max, thank you for the great frame. And I am officially saying this is my favorite uh, discussion out of all of the ones of this uh, Big ID series. And you all know that, that that's likely to be true. One of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic that this is part of it is that uh, there's been such a siloed conversation about uh, wildlife conservation and then climate planning. The Wildlife Action Plan lives in a completely di different section of DOEE than the Sustainability Administration and all of the conversations about adaptation and um, mitigation. And one of the things I'd like to see as part of this series, Chris, that you've organized is that we really, um, require and request that the city takes a much more integrated look at a uh, climate response, one that includes biodiversity and one that includes a response to these uh, both flora and fauna issues. So that's really one of my great hopes for this is that we integrate a lot of what we heard today and make it part of the mainstream conversation. So when we go to those quarterly meetings at DOEE, that it's not just about solar panels. Yeah, that, that's great. And, um, you know, somebody who's really good about that is Chris, um, you know, who's regularly on the a key player in the quarterly meetings. And, you know, a, a good way to, that's a good point to bring up the, um, uh, make sure there aren't silos as we, um, as our local government serves our wildlife and animal interests. If I could just add, you know, one of the things that uh, what I wanted to do is, is at least have a, a number of, of panels uh, beginning the, these conversations of how to how this stuff is all interconnected um, and, and starting to use the word climate more. And when you're describing all these goals, you know, the word how that and constantly go back to how, why, why is it important to do the things that were on your list that are on your your um, your your final kind of conclusions list but 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 connect you know make sure it's clear because people need to understand that this stuff is connected to climate and um so anyway i'm real i'm really pleased that we've, we we've had four we'll, we'll have, we will have had four panels with parks wildlife and and uh, conservation uh focused um, um ex, uh, experts focusing on on you know how their their sector uh, relates to climate the climate crisis. So, and and I think I think um, when we talk to the agencies, when we talk to Tommy and folks, and when we talk to elected officials, we'll just have to start weaving all that together better. And uh, but we it's not like we haven't done it, but we you know we should we need everyone in the fight, as I said at the beginning, and uh, so we got to figure out how to work. How to, how to weave our issues together. Thanks, Chris, and thank you for that uh, question, Stella. I'm seeing more good questions come in the chat. Um, uh, Feline says, what can be done to stop killing of deer in Rock Creek Park? And I'll, I'll chime in by saying that this is an issue that we've been very involved in, um, really trying to get the National Park Service to move on their, uh, insistence that the deer need to be killed. And indeed, the um, uh, first of all, the Park Service has been just really untransparent with how they're using taxpayer dollars to manage the ecosystems. And we'd like them to be a lot more clear about what their goals are and, and their progress towards their goals. They've been killing deer in Rock Creek Park for uh, eight years, and they are look, proposing to expand that to parks and National Capital Parks East, which is Ward six, seven, and eight, and actually it spills over into Maryland. So they're expanding their deer, deer killing regime, or they're proposing that. 
Um, and so they, they've had a couple common periods. We weighed in on that. Um, we do have an event coming up at a um, uh, town hall with National Park Service. If you wanna be part of speaking up for that, um, speaking up for the deer, um, we'll be calling for nonviolent solutions, really urging the Park Service to dig deep into contraceptives as an alternative to killing the deer and um, uh, you know pursuing something other than gun violence. So thank you for that question. Feline and anything, uh, Anne or Jim, to add to that? No, I think you handled it. Great. Next question. Uh, Sheila says, um, the presentation is about DC, but flying creatures do not know there are borders with Virginia and Maryland. What collaborative efforts are being made with other jurisdictions? Uh, well, I can start with that. Um, Talk about silos. Um, this is true of all the states, and each state has its own regulations regarding wildlife. Uh, one of the biggest problems we've had is being able to transport wildlife across state, state lines, even for purposes of rehabilitation. And we now have pretty good arrangements with Maryland. Maryland tends to be very cooperative, and uh, we're taking some animals from Maryland and in turn releasing other animals in Maryland. Um, but Virginia has a fairly insular attitude toward wildlife. They won't let it cross state lines in either direction, except in special circumstances. And um, they, they haven't really make an, made an effort to think regionally about wildlife. But in some ways, um, the rehabilitation movement has taken a national turn. We have conferences all over the country and wildlife rehabbers and wildlife advocates from all over the country are themselves creating regional networks that in some ways uh, kind of jump over the states as long as nothing we do is illegal. But obviously, I mean, that's a very good question. Obviously, these issues are re regional and the wildlife don't respect the boundaries. So we've got to start thinking regionally on all climate issues, not just wildlife. May I reiterate on my question for you? My, my specific interest was by showing the uh, Amazon uh, second headquarters. Uh -huh. uh, I'm in Al I live in Alexandria and Arlington. I could walk over to the county line. Mm -hmm. And I know that that building you're talking about is quite controversial here in Northern Virginia. And I wondered if Arlington County is doing anything. I'm thinking about what you said about the birds flying into those windows there. And yes, they can plant all the green they want, but all that's gonna do is attract more flying animals to go over there, some more birds, which are gonna crash into the windows. And I wondered if anything is being done to engage Arlington County to get them to engage Amazon. Um, not that I'm aware of. The American Bird Conservancy is on top of this issue. And I don't think they've, they're working nationally with Amazon on the issue. I don't know that they've done anything locally. And we've been trying to get a, a bird um, monitoring program in Arlington for a number of years. And a lot of people have been interested in it. But to my knowledge, there's not an active um, bird glass collision coalition in Arlington. And uh, there should be because some of those buildings are killing birds. So any, anybody want, who wants to start that initiative, uh, we would greatly support it. And, and also uh, we would be very interested in coming to talk to any Arlington community that might want to engage with this particular building because we, um, we can cite chapter and verse about how this building could be a pretty bad bird killer. So, uh, you know, take our resources and call us and we'll, we'll engage with anyone in Arlington who's interested. Thank you. That, that's very helpful about that willingness to do a presentation uh, if they have not already looked at it. Unfortunately, I'm not in that county. So even yeah. though it's close by, I can't, I can't do anything about that. But I think anybody who knows somebody there ought to ask. And if you've got a similar problem with City of Alexandria, I'd be happy to go to bat for you guys there. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go to our next question, I see several people are already taking action or planning to take action uh, based on the in input from this presentation. So very cool. Kudos to you for bringing into action. 
Um, next up, uh, question of whether you see any impacts on wildlife from litter, garbage cans, or plastic waste in the district. Do you want to take that, Jim, or do you want me to? Take oh, yeah, that? no, that, well. <laughs> Our favorite topic. Yeah, no, the, the, the most obvious is the animals that get stuck in it. And we've had a number of patients that um, have been caught up in fishing lines, swallowed fish hooks, have had plastic um, garbage trapped around their necks. Um, and it, it's really heartbreaking because the animals need help. It's, it, it would be easy to help them. But of course, animals don't understand altruism, so they don't let you catch them. Um, and often, in fact, uh, by the time we can capture the animal to treat them, it's, it's too late. And we have tragically monitored some animals that never got into the rehabilitation center to be saved um, because they died before they could be captured. So that's the most obvious thing. Um, you know, six pack rings is the, the famous example. And there are still people out there who are throwing away six pack rings without clipping them. And they are still um, killing animals. But then in general, the degradation to the environment that these animals depend on, you know, like if you look at the banks of the Anacostia River, and that's where these animals live. It's as if you came home from work one day and some garbage truck had just dumped its entire load in your front yard. I mean, it, it's bound to be harmful and it does have an effect on, on how these animals can live. So um, yeah, uh, it, it's a huge problem. And, um, and we've done some, some work. We put out a couple of blogs. There's information on our website about litter and particularly in waterways. It's, it's extremely, uh, extremely harmful to animals. As so we the bag speak, law oh, is sorry. a great thing. You know, we're, we're a big fan of the bag law. We'd love to see the, uh, the five or 10 cents uh, deposit on plastic bottles come through. That would be a great help. There, right now, there are two animals we're monitoring. Uh, there's a goose in the tidal basin that has plastic mesh all wrapped around its bill and we can't catch it. And there, there are also several what we call string foot pigeons. Um, they're pigeons that get string tangled around their feet, the toes atrophy and fall off, and then they become what we call peg leg pigeons. And if we can capture the pigeon soon enough, we can remove that string, save the foot and save the pigeon. And so one of the things that we keep trying to do is to identify the types of litter that create these sorts of ha hazards. Jim, Jim mentioned um, uh, the, the uh, six pack things. Anytime, even when you're recycling, anytime you're throwing away anything that's a closed circle, you should cut that circle open, even if it's little milk can tabs, anything, because the circle is what traps the animals in it. And then in terms of string, um, no string and particularly um, strangely, these hair weave pieces, uh, that's what's getting tangled in the feet of these birds um, most often. So any string wire, fishing wire, uh, should never be left on the ground. Um, and we could go on and on about these things, yogurt cans that the, that the raccoons get their heads caught in and so on. But it's a tremendous problem. And it's just education. People don't realize that that these items can cause the kind of uh, real torture to animals. One of our ducks that we couldn't catch um, had a six pack around its bill and we monitored it for two weeks, unable to catch it and finally found it dead. And this is just utterly heartbreaking and totally unnecessary. So, you know, with that sad note, please cut your six packs. <laughs> Yeah, every year we have a um, PR campaign to try and get people to refrain from putting those fake spider webs on their bushes. That can be deadly for birds and other animals as well. Garden netting, some of the stuff is put out there intentionally like garden netting and, and don't even get us started on glue traps. Yeah. Now, how about um, species that are migrating to the area due to climate change. Now Annette asks maybe fire ants, which have been found in Southern Maryland. 
Um, are there other species that we know of that are migrating to our region or migration patterns are changing due to climate change? The um, spotted lantern fly has just shown up in the community gardens across the street from City Wildlife, and um, that promises to be a rather destructive um, animal. Um, but I'm not aware of most of the um, most of the newcomers to the regions have been like the roseate spoonbill, the the big guys that get noticed right away. Um, so I'm sure that we'll see more of this as time goes on. But right now. Um, yeah, it's, it's there are some insects that will be harmful in that they um, devastate the foliage that the other more beneficial insects depend on. The emerald ash borer is coming down from Pennsylvania and it's it's destroyed a great many ash trees in the area and the ash tree is one of the best wildlife habitat trees there is so that's going to be a great loss and there's a Asian um, a ladybug that's come in too, that I don't think eats vegetation, but has displaced our native ladybug, which is a very beneficial insect because it eats aphids. So um, I think as much as, as the, the animals themselves are invasive, it's the ones that are killing the, the good plants that are maybe turn out to be a greater problem. But you know, all these things we have to keep an eye out for. Yeah, I, I wanted to add something. If we can go back to, um, I think it was um, Sheila's comment um, about regionalism. And I would like to share, it's, it's important, I think, to share good news because sometimes things look so hopeless. But um, a bad thing happened last spring in that mystery bird disease that I think most people have heard about all of a sudden finding all these birds dying and dead. And um, we still don't know what that was caused by. Um, it went away as the um, breeding season ended. Um, but one good thing to come out of that is that the rehabber started sharing information and then so did the local governments, the various DNRs and state veterinarians all started cooperating and got some traction with the feds when we sent uh, samples to the main national wildlife disease laboratory in Wisconsin. So nice networks came out of that. Our veterinarian was, um, uh, Dr. Chuljian, was particularly instrumental in terms of building up the network um, and making sure that the district was included. Because this was really this area, not just Washington, but this area was the epicenter for that disease. And, um, and people came together and shared information and, and monitored, but those people are still in touch with one another. So we can um, react fairly quickly and we can share resources and good things do happen. But Sheila's quite right, you know, birds don't stay in one place. And that was, you know, one of the things that I wanted to highlight in my talk is you, you can create a national park for the animals to live in, but they don't stay there. Anyway. And we can create the space in our, our own environments that make it more accommodating as they expand out of their, yes. their own zones and spill over. So I see Chris, uh, you have some, some comments to make? Well, j just I'm, I'm thinking climate and we've mentioned a lot of things. You guys mentioned very expertly a lot of things like, um, um, you know, cats and, 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 and dealing with Amazon and and, and, and when I just a comment, I think what these things do, if we can fix these problems and especially the longstanding ones, like, you know, the birds flying into badly designed buildings um, is then we can make up for the diversity, some of the diversity loss that's gonna happen anyway, because of temper bone shifts, temperate zone shifts and all that, the, you know, it's the storms and all that kind of stuff. So is that is that kind of what you're saying too? Is that, um, we need to do all these things that you've been advocating for anyway, because it's all part of making sure um, where if we can do that more efficiently, like uh, save more birds from running into glass windows, then um, you know we're, we're gonna be solving some of the problem of loss in, in DC. Is, is that, and that's a, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. It's a big thing on climate because 
doing those things will make up for the loss that other climate impacts will probably probably bring to our our wildlife in DC. No? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think that one of the one of the bright spots in all of this is that there are lots of little things that you can do that that add up that do have an impact. I mean, just treating the windows on your own house. When I moved into the house where I'm in now, it was a terrible problem for birds and had been going on for I don't know decades, but it doesn't kill any more birds. And our yard is now hosting a lot more animals than it used to. There's all kinds of things that um, that one can do. And just when you go to the grocery store, bird-friendly coffee. There's lots of um, things when you go to buy plants at the nursery. Look out for the pesticides, the neonics. Make sure you're not bringing them home. Um, so there's a lot of this problem that it seems like much too big for an individual to deal with. But on the other hand, you can make quite a bit of progress on a very local level, right in your own home, right? In terms of what you eat and what you do. As Ann said, cutting those, um, every, every plastic ring, everything circular before it goes in the recycling, snip it. So Jim, as an exercise in this conversation, say what you just said, but connect it to climate change in, in a broad, broad sense. Well, I think that in climate change, in my mind, it just makes all of the things that we've been doing, all of the attempts to solve ongoing problems much more critical because things are getting worse fast. And essentially uh, saving habitat, well, we've been trying to save habitat for a long time, but now we've run out of time. Now we got to do it and we got to do it in a big way. Uh, and the same, I mean, bird glass collisions has been a real problem. But when we're starting to lose birds at the rate in which we're losing them now, we can't afford to sit back and think about this anymore. It's time to act. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. We aim to please, Dr. Weiss. <laughs> There's one question um, would, about wildlife corridors um, from Andrea. Wouldn't they have to be integrated across municipalities and shareholders? What movement is there to policy change or funding. Um, I don't, uh, every state has its own wildlife action plan and I'm sure they all mention wildlife corridors, but I don't sense much of a movement to link them. However, a wildlife corridor can be really very small and still be effective. Um, daylighting these streams is really important for wildlife, not only for water quality. And a lot of them east of the Anacostia uh, even, even a small daylighted stream creates a corridor between the woodland and the river that can be very productive. So um, yes, a long corridor allows more movement, but these small corridors are, are really important too. And Jim's, Jim's points of, you know, it, basically what Jim is saying is that um, your, your yard can be part of a corridor as long as it's uh, supported by other yards along the route. They can all act as a big corridor if people get together. Do we have any some, more questions? Some, some praise and examples, instances of good wildlife practices in the, um, in the chat. And um, unless anybody has any final questions, uh, um, I'd like to turn it, you know, just to some final remarks from uh, Anne and Jim or Chris. Um, and I, I too have some uh, final things to highlight and ways that people can actually plug and take action. Do you have any final remarks, Jim? Oh, well, just thank you to everyone. It's so heartening that people are interested and concerned. Um, sometimes talk about silos, sometimes you feel kind of lonely in this field, but it's really good to know that um, you're not alone. People do care. And in that so much can be done on a very small level, there's some hope here. And, and also, um, please use us as a resource. Um, we come out and talk to all kinds of groups, um, particularly adults. Uh, but we'll talk to one adult or two adult in a, in a group. So please remember that. And if you have a receptive audience, 
um, please call us and certainly call us with individual individual animal um, uh, problems. That's what we're here for. So thank you all. Um, I just like to say one, one, one more thing. Um, yeah. on, on December 3rd um, at two o'clock, I believe, we're going to be reporting uh, back to uh, a number of council members, uh, the director of DOE, um, a member of the Public Service Commission, and a number of others. We're going to report back to them our findings um, from the nine conversations that we had, you know, about the, the priorities that we think they should start looking at or should start moving on. And maybe um, one last thing we could do in the next couple of weeks is convene a smaller working group. And anyone that wants to get involved with that, just just email me, uh, but um, where we can just put together a page that kind of summarizes as it relates to climate. And um, I'm asking all the other uh, panels and, and other sectors to do the same thing. And then we'll figure out how to incorporate that into a presentation to these decision makers on December 3rd at two o'clock. And just kind of it's taking information and knowledge and, and doing some advocacy. Um, with the folks that can actually have a, a major impact on this. And that's all I have to say. So shut it down, awesome. Max. <laughs> well, you know, that was great, Chris. Very excited about that. And just want to let folks know that, you know, we talked about some great things here, but there are some actions you can take, not just in your personal life, but on a systemic level. I'm going to put in the chat the link to the Lights Out DC program that City Wildlife runs. If you want to volunteer with that, highly recommend you know getting involved and being a being a, a monitor to identify where the hot spots are for birds being killed um and you know just it can really make an impact on uh dc's wildlife setup and then i'm also going to um, put in the chat a link to the rest of the conference the the conference is not over there's several uh cool very cool panels happening tomorrow so you may want to check those out and um, uh, join for some more. I know I will be, and um, and I look forward to seeing you some more. Some more of you there. Big kudos to Chris for putting this on. Yes. Well, thanks to you. Couldn't have done it without you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care, y'all.